Hello, my name is Judith Hewitt. I'm the manager of the Devil's Porridge Museum, and I've created this little video for people to use to find out about the history of HM Factory Gretna. So I'm going to share my screen um, and show you uh, uh, some images uh, that I hope you find of interest. So. so the Devil's Porridge Museum, which is where I am right now, one of the most important things to know about World War I is that it didn't just happen in the trenches and it wasn't just fought by men. And that's what the Devil's Porridge Museum is all about. We're about what happened in World War I right here in Southwest Scotland, Northern England, and what happened to the people who were involved here. Many of them men, um, but a lot of them women as well. So let's just give a little bit of background information. Let's go back to the start to World War I over a hundred years ago. World War I was supposed to be a quick war, a war of offensives. Both sides were really confident. The um, central uh, powers, the German side and the, the allies, the British side or the Entente, the British side, were really confident that they would achieve an early decisive victory. They based this on the War of 1870 where the Prussians had invaded France and achieved quite a bit quick victory. And they thought it's gonna be the same this time. We'll be lots of invasions, lots of quick battles and it'll all be over famously by Christmas, so it was said. However, as we now know, the war, instead of lasting a couple of months, became a stalemate. Instead of it being a sprint, a really fast race, it became a marathon, a long slog, a really drawn out, prolonged battle, conflict. Um, the war ceased to be about movement. So in the early days, there was rapid in invasions of different countries. And instead, it became about attrition. So who can destroy and grind down the other side? And the key factor in the war became logistics. Who can supply their trench? Can they supply their trench with men, fighting people? Can they supply their trench, keep those men fed and supply that trench with food? And can they supply that trench with weapons? In 1915, the British could supply their trench with men. They could feed those men, but they could not supply those men with munitions, with armaments. And that led to something called the shell crisis, a lack of shells, a lack of bullets. And it seemed in 1915 that Britain was going to lose World War I because the soldiers at the front didn't have any bullets and they didn't have any shells. So let's just remind ourselves about the importance of shells and munitions in World War I. This is an aerial photograph uh, showing the trenches. You can see the lines there. And these big pock marks, it looks like the surface of the moon. Actually, those are shell craters. Um, that were created by all the pounding of the artillery in World War I. So the guns were hungry and they needed to be fed. And this is what this image shows. This is the food. These are the shells that would go into the cannons, the artillery, that would then be fired uh, at the opposing side. Um, so before you can fire a gun or fire a, a, a cannon, you, someone needs to make the bullet that goes inside it. They need to make the physical case, the brass case, um, the metal case. Someone also needs to make what goes inside the bullet or the shell. And that's what happened here at HM Factory Gretna in World War One. Millions of shells were used in World War One. This picture really evokes it. These are empty shell casings um, from one battle. You can see on the side here, uh, boxes that were full of shells just dumped by the side of the road and then these empty spent shells and on the far side of the picture you can see some full shells ready to go and still be used and this is what the, they were feeding the guns that were hungry so the shell would be loaded in there and then fired at the enemy um, in the hope that um, this sort of battery would help win the war so this background about shells and bombs and explosions, that led to the creation of something called HM Factory Gretna, which is the main story of the Devil's Porridge Museum. Um, so the 
As a result of the shower crisis, the government changed and David Lloyd George became in charge of the Ministry of Munitions. He brought in experts from around the world to help him transform the supply of weapons to the Western Front. They built this huge factory at the Anglo-Scottish border and it was the biggest factory on earth at the time. So have a look at this photograph. This is a modern day aerial image showing the extent of the factory. It came all the way from Dornoch in Scotland um, to a long town in England. So that was nine miles long and two miles wide. Um, and you can see where the museum is now in Eastrix, just there in the center of this large factory complex. So it wasn't factory all the way across, it was built on the principle of dispersal, so there'd be bits here, bits there in case there was to be a major explosion. Um, the museum is located near Site 3, this pinkish area, and you can still see quite a lot of um, the industrial archaeology that still remains in this area, um, on this aerial photograph. A lot of it dates from World War II, um, but some of it is from World War I. And here it is that they mixed the devil's porridge. Um, so that evocative phrase was uh, coined by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle when he saw girls, as in this picture, mixing together white lumpy stuff in big pots like this. And he thought white lumpy mixed by women in pots in Scotland, it's porridge, but a devilish sort because it's not actually porridge that you could eat. It is a uh, porridge that is made of acids and all sorts of other chemicals. And what they were actually creating, um, the devil's porridge was a nickname for this. This is its final product. So this is it in its raw state when it was being mixed together. It would eventually be dried out into these spaghetti-like shapes and that's called cordite. So called because it looks like shoelaces, cords, um, it, when it's in its uh, raw form. Um, so this, Cordite would go inside every single bullet, every single single bomb that was used in World War One had cordite inside of it. Uh, every single shell and bullet, sorry, would go have cordite inside of it, just like this. And that was what was made here. And uh, at the moment, this uh, filming this in March 2021, right in the middle of Women's History Month. Um, and it seems an appropriate time just to talk about the Gretna girls, which is what they were called at the time. So they worked eight hour shifts um, when the factory was operational, which it was 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They were recruited from across the British Isles. We know of one girl from Cornwall. We know of one from the Isle of Man. We know there were Gaelic speakers, so they must have been from the Highlands. We know of people who came from Ireland, Aberdeenshire, County Durham, the Northeast, um, Sunderland. Uh, lots of people came from the northwest of England, so Cumbria, Carlisle, and lots of people came from Glasgow and the rest of Scotland. 80% of them were single, so they were mostly unmarried, and they were mostly young, aged 18 or under. And their work came over under the Official Secrets Act. Everything here was uh, classified. And at what, any one time, there were 12,000 women working at the factory, and we know the names of a couple of a hundred of them. Just show you some images of the sorts of work that they, they did. So it was young women were involved in engineering, uh, using um, machinery like this, uh, and also in, so you can see a little bit of uh, early uh, PPE in the form of face masks here and the mixing of chemicals, mixing together gun cotton, which is this white substance, um, which is the basis of cordite. They're mixing together with acids and other things like this. It's very dangerous, difficult, unpleasant work. These photographs, which look like they're taken in the day, but they would have been they would have been people manning these stations throughout the night, um, seven days a week. Um, so that's quite a good image. We've got some of these large pots in the museum, um, and we've got about ten of them. But it looks like there were maybe you know, several dozen of them in this picture. This is uh, mixing together chemicals in potchers. Um, this is some of the most unpleasant work in the factory because of the fumes that were involved. Um, and then women were also involved in science, uh, measuring out the chemicals with great accuracy for use in the production of cordite. And these are some more images showing the women doing uh, sampling acids from the top of the towers uh, in the factory and some more images showing them doing this work, which was comparatively new to women at the start of the 20th century. 
This picture shows them drying out the cordite at the long turn, so in the English side of the factory. Uh, and it's interesting because it says a Merry Christmas on the drying stove in the middle there, just above the lady in the middle's head. Uh, and also you can see she's holding uh, cordite in her hands there. So that's the long strips that would be dried out to go inside the shells and go inside the bullets that were used in the trenches in World War One. And these are them being dried for storage. They weren't actually put into shells, so into the metal uh, casings at HM Factory Gretna. They were put into cases like this, the cordite, and then they were shipped to other places, to shell filling factories. And then other young women would put the cordite into the shell casing, and then that would be shipped off to the trenches for use at the front. So this image here, the on-war service badge, that's our logo, the Devil's Porridge Museum logo. Uh, and they started to be issued in 1916 to all women working in munitions factories throughout Britain. And over 270,000 badges were issued in the first year. Um, you had to be on the job for two months and then you could receive this badge. And each one has got a unique number on the back. And we have several in the museum collection. And we would love to find out who they belong to. The number on the back must relate to a particular woman. Um, but we don't yet have that information. So here are some photographs of the young women involved um, sitting outside their hut, one of their huts that they lived in initially. So initially, they stayed in wooden huts and then walked to the factory. Um, and uh, here are some more images of the young women and the friendships that they made. Some of them made lifelong friends, some of them fell in love, some of them had horrible time, some of them had a comparatively pleasant time, the variety of experiences and a variety of thoughts about the war. This uh, photograph shows the Moss Band Swifts, that is the women's football team associated with the factory. Um, you can see in the centre there, it says uh, Moss Band AFC, Athletic Football Club. Um, and also nice to see one of the children of one of the workers in the centre there too. Um, people often ask us what's left of HM Factory Gretna. Are there any World War I buildings here? Is, is there much of the factory left? The answer to that is no, there isn't much of the factory itself left. But almost all of the houses that the workers later lived in, so initially the houses were built out of wood, but as the war progressed, they built these large substantial um, hostels. Um, those hostels and houses still stand. The townships of Eastriggs and Gretna, Eastriggs is where the museum is, were built just to house the workers um, for HM Factory Gretna. And this photograph shows them in their heyday. They're, these houses are still lived in by people um, and you can go and walk around and see this used to be the police station, this used to be the fire station, this used to be a hostel where World War I workers um, stayed. Inside the hostels, uh, each young woman had a cubicle like these ones here and the cubicles uh, didn't have doors on them, they just had a curtain so that they could be policed and the matrons of the hostels and the women's police service could make sure that they weren't getting up to any funny business with young men at night time so they didn't have much privacy but they also had quite a good social life this is the cinema that was built um, and uh, this is showing one of the rest of restrooms where they could meet and discuss so the cinema was very popular in world war one and they built everything you would need for modern lifestyle. Um, so they had schools, a dentist, a maternity unit. Uh, this is a photograph of Gretna School when it opened. And they also built churches. This is Anvil Hall and Gretna, which was the Roman Catholic Church in World War I. And they had dance halls like this one here. So there were lots of social aspects to working at the factory as well. So they had football clubs, um, hockey clubs, a gymnasium, dance hall, cinemas, scientific societies and lectures and talks um, and all sorts of other things, anything that you might like to get involved with, they provided that social aspect for the workers too. All of the, were, all of the um, actions and behaviours of the Gretna girls was overseen by the Women's Police Service. So there were over 150 members of the Women's Police Service. It was the largest one in the country at the time. And they kept an eye on the behaviour of the young women. It was all during wartime and all their actions came under the Official Secrets Act. 
but they also kept an eye on their morals and their behavior. So policing a curfew, making sure people got back to their hostels uh, before the curfew started, um, making sure that girls didn't get into sexual relationships with young men, uh, and also making sure that men and women weren't uh, getting up to any hanky-panky in the back of the cinema or in the train carriages, which were male and female only train carriages. So they would police the stations to make sure that was enforced. There was also a fire brigade at the factory um, and this picture shows them there and the fire truck, as well as this, which gives you an idea of the dangers at HM Factory Gretna. This is the acid recovery unit. They look like they're going scuba diving. But the clue in this picture is in the foreground, you can see a folded up stretcher. Uh, so if there were to be a major acid leak, these were the people who would go in in this gear to clean it up. So they were working with incredibly da dangerous chemicals that could poison the individual through inhalation. So you inhale the fumes and it could give you a hacking cough, a terrible headache, and there are some cases of skin discoloration as well, turning the, eye, the white of the eyes yellow. Um, but it could also, obviously, if you've got undiluted acid on your skin, you could get, receive acid burns. And there are cases of people who died as a result of contact with acids. And there were people who died as a result of explosions and fire. This picture shows one of the women's welfare rooms where the girls could take a rest there's a description that the museum has um, that says that it's, they, some girls were rolling around as if they were drunk because they were high on the fumes that they were inhaling. Um, and this was somewhere that they could rest because the work was difficult, uh, labor intensive, and also working with deeply unpleasant chemicals uh, throughout the night sometimes. There were hospitals built as well, and there were cases of um, epidemics and pandemics like the Spanish flu um, and uh, people would be hospitalized and this was provided for them. This young woman is Agnes Gardner. Uh, she was a 17 year old young woman from Keswick uh, who lost her arm in an industrial accident. Her arm was torn out while working at HM Factory Gretna. So while the majority of mutilations and deaths in World War One happened on the front, obviously, and happened to the young men who were fighting in the front line in the trenches. We mustn't forget that there were young women whose bodies were mutilated as a result of working in munitions. And some young women lost their lives. And this young woman here, 17 years old, she lost her arm. Um, one can only imagine the agony of that, but also the lifelong disability that she would have encountered uh, throughout her life. Uh, another even more tragic case is that of Roberta Robertson. She was killed following an explosion at the factory in 1917. The, some of the factory exploded and she was crushed by an iron girder that fell on her. Um, she had a large funeral. Uh, she was from Dumfries and she's actually recorded on Gretna Parish Church War Memorial and on Dumfries Memorial, which is quite unusual for a female munitions worker to be recorded on a war memorial. Usually on a war memorial, it will say the regiment of the person. So it might say such and such who was in this regiment, KOSB, King's Own Scottish Borderers or something like that. On this war memorial, it says Roberta Roberts, MW, munitions worker. Um, and I think it's quite nice, really, that she was uh, commemorated in this way, um, although it's only really recently that people have started to give as much attention to the female contribution to war as to that to the men. We know of several other deaths and accidents that took place in the factory. Um, at the end of the war, the factory closed at 12 noon on November the 11th, 1918. There was a parade in the streets led by the factory brass band, the dance in the evening. People said, what are we gonna do with this massive factory now, the war to end all wars, the raison d'etre, the reason the factory exists is no longer here. Should we keep the factory in case there were to be another war or should we repurpose it for something else to produce something else? Um, what actually happens is the factory quite quickly started to shut down on one day in December, 4,000 people were made unemployed. 
the majority of the young women went back to their pre-war occupations. Many of the people who'd come from Australia and uh, South Africa, et cetera, returned to their countries of origin. And eventually the factory and townships were auctioned off and sold. In World War II, the site was used as an ammunition depot. Some of that land is still owned by the Ministry of Defence today in East Riggs and in Longtown. The Devil's Porridge Museum is located less than a mile from one of the main sites, ESD East Riggs. And we've been sharing Gretna's secret war for nearly 25 years. So that's just a little brief introduction to HM Factory Gretna, which I hope you find interesting, particularly if you're studying in school. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to come and visit us, either yourself as an individual, or we will do welcome school groups uh, in the future. So I hope to see you here soon when it's safe for you to visit. There's lots and lots of more to find out. And it's a great day out with lots to see and interact with. And we do offer different sessions depending on what aspect of the curriculum you are studying. So hope to see you here sometime. For more details, see our website. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.